Let's go ahead and take our Bibles and open them to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter number 26. Matthew chapter number 26. Oh, Lord, help us. I am so encouraged in the work of the Lord here today. And there is so much that He is doing today that I am some, to some degree struggling to stay focused. So I think what we ought to do is stand to our feet out of reverence for the reading of His Word. And then we're going to beg Him that by the power of His Holy Spirit that He would speak to us today. Matthew, Matthew chapter number 26, and I'm going to begin reading in verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. And said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful. Even unto death tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face. And prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, and their eyes were heavy, and he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now. And take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand, hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, He is at hand that doth betray me. My eyes and my attention again are drawn to what is said in verse number 42. O oh, my Father, if... This cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. Thy will be done. This morning I would like to preach a message entitled, Pass the Cup. Father, I pray that you would help us here this morning. Lord, I beg you that you would empty me of myself, that there not be one ounce of Jared remaining on this stage. Oh, dear God, that you fill me with the power of your spirit. Lord, we would take a, take a look inside that cup that the Lord was holding in the garden of Gethsemane as he lifted his eyes then to the Father and prayed in such a way as to ask that this cup may pass from him. Lord, I pray that you would give us clarity by your word of what's in that cup. And Lord, that we would look to the cup that our own hand is holding. And we would see it as it turns about. And as we lift it to our own lips and we smell the contents of it. Lord, I pray that you would be real to us this morning. And that the contents of that cup would be understood. We pray for your spirit's understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Much confusion is said about these verses. 
And to be honest, I will not be able to stand here this morning and clarify all the confusion that may be surrounded in your own personal understanding or in your own personal study. So for that, I ask you on the front end of this message that you would forgive me and that we would see the point clearly and not be confused by the things that we do not understand. One thing, however, that we can say is that when Jesus prayed to the Father and he says, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Let us not be confused, for he was not asking. He was not asking if it was possible for him to walk away from the death of the cross. Because quite frankly, it was possible for him to walk away from the death of the cross. In the sovereign will of the Father, it was not possible for him to walk away and still have sin atoned. However, it was well within the realm of the possibility for the Lord Jesus Christ to turn his back on all of humanity and to remove himself from the garden altogether. Jesus was not in a place where the arrest and crucifixion was inevitable. Because no man took his life. He was not boxed in. He had options, if you will. He could have walked away from death at any time, even while pinned by the Roman nails to that cross. He could have called 10,000 angels to remove him and would have been justified in doing so. He tells us with his own voice earlier in the Gospels that he laid down his life. No man took it. Even when he was on that cross, the Bible tells us that he gave up the ghost. It was not the spear which took his life, nor the spikes. It wasn't the blood that poured from his open wounds that caused him to die. For this is God Almighty and omnipotent in strength. He is the almighty God. He is the one that by his very breath breathed life into mankind. And just as much as his breath was able to say, into, my, into your hands I commend my spirit. So could his breath had said, I take up my own life now and come off of this cross. Was it possible for that cup to be removed? Yes, it was. But it was not the will of the Father. And what would it have been? What power, what, what trembling, what fierceness lay in that cup in the Lord's hand in the Garden of Gethsemane that would take the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, to a place in a garden where he would say to the Father, if it be possible, as if to say, if there be some other way, if there be some other path that could be taken to redeem all of mankind. What was it that, that gripped and trembled the heart of the God, man, when he looked into that cup, what was in that cup? I would say that what was in that cup was the fierceness of God's wrath against sin. But say, well, Pastor Jared, how is it that you come to that conclusion that it was the fierceness of God's wrath against sin? It's because this is not the first time that we read of a cup in Scripture and correlate that cup with God's given description of it. First thing that I could tell you about this cup and what was in this cup is this was the cup of reckoning. In the 25th chapter of the prophet Jeremiah, on the 15th verse, the Bible says, For thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand, and cause all nations to whom I send thee to drink it. 
Time and time again throughout Scripture, we see this cup mentioned as the fierceness of God's wrath, that the nations will tremble at the wrath of God. And we see in Psalm 11 that upon the wicked he shall remain snares, fires, and brimstone, and a horrible temptest. This shall be the portion of their cup. In Psalm 75, verse number 8, the Bible tells us that, that this cup, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. In Isaiah 51, verse number 17, the Bible calls it the cup of trembling. And now here is the Lord Jesus Christ with an unusual cup in his hand in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was not a cup that he had earned. It was not a cup that he had merited. It was a cup that was handed to him by all of mankind. But what was in that cup? First off, it was the cup of reckoning. As Jeremiah describes, he says in verse number 15 of the 25th chapter, take the wine cup of this fury. It was the cup of God's fury. If you could imagine all of the strength and might and glory of God, but yet that might and strength poured out on indignity in this world, and that would be a description of his wrath. The problem with us is we have convinced ourselves that God is not angry about anything and God is not mad and that God is not wrathful, but instead he is a God of peace and joy and love and mercy and grace and reconciliation. And yes, he is all of those things. But the Bible also warns us that we would beware of the terror of the Lord. Uh, there was a preacher many years ago by the name of Jonathan Edwards who preached a message entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And the church needs to be awakened once again to the reality that God is not pleased with our sin. And in his hot displeasure, it is the will of God to pour out the wrath of God upon all wickedness and all ungodliness in this world. And some of that wickedness and some of that in godliness is in us. And when we look to the future prophetic pages of scripture, we see the wrath of God poured out on this world as this earth is melted with a fervent heat as he comes with eyes that are as a flame of fire to consume wickedness on this earth. And in that cup in the Lord's hand is that day of reckoning. You see, sin is an offense to a holy God. But this was not just the cup of reckoning. This was the cup reserved. The Bible says in Psalm eleven six, it tells us this, that upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. And then it makes this statement. This shall be the portion of their cup. Of their cup. There is a cup of wrath because of sin that is reserved with our name on it. With our name on it. And making up the bowl of this cup is every indiscretion, every sin, every lie, every lustful or adulterous thought, every act of pride or jealousy or bitterness, every cross word that is out, out of the bounds of Scripture, everything that we desire to hide away and conceal from the rest of the world or paint with some other excuse as to why we did it. It makes up the bowl of this cup, but inside that cup is the cup of reckoning and it is the cup of Reserved the wrath of God reserved for all ungodliness. In Psalm 11, verse number 6, the Bible describes what type of wrath is reserved with our name on it. It says that he will rain fire and brimstone. And this is the kind of preaching that seems to be absent from the most popular churches in America today. This idea that there is still a hell that burns hot and is just as real as this 
sanctuary is here today. And there is no thermostat in this place, but it burns with the wrath and the fury of God. And it is reserved for all those who die without Christ Jesus. And there are souls in hell right now that have been burning there for centuries and years. And as we sing that glorious song in the last verse, uh, that, that glorious song of amazing grace, we sing that last verse that when we come to this place, we'll have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. And we rejoice in that, but let's never forget that as we have no less days to sing his praise than when we first begun. For those who are in a devil's hell burning in the lake of fire, they will have no less days to suffer the wrath that is reserved for them. Just as much as we see the love of God in Christ Jesus, we need to understand that our God is holy and just. And if he is holy and if he is just, which he is, then there must be a punishment for sin. Now, we do not live in our own universe, but instead we live in the universe of God. And you can come up with your own uh, virtual reality and your own metaverse. But the reality is this, is that God decides the punishment. And the punishment from the Bible we see is a burning hell where the fire is not quenched and the worm dieth not. In Psalm eleven six, it does not just describe it as a fire and brimstone type of judgment but a horrible tempest. It is a storm that you will never be able to escape from. And inside the cup that the Lord Jesus Christ was holding, raged that storm of God's wrath, reserved for the ungodly. But it's not just the cup of reckoning, the cup reserved. But this is the part that scares me the most. And this is the cup required. Psalm 75 verse number 8 tells us this. It tells us that all the wicked are required to drink this cup. Psalm 75 verse number 8 it says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red and is a full of mixture. In other words, it's potent. There is nothing held back. And I am reminded that there will come a day that the wrath of the Lord will not be held back. And there will be no more time for mercy or for grace. But the time of those things has ended. The Bible says that he poureth out the same, but the dregs thereof all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. This is the cup required. This causes me to, to fear and to tremble. Just as the Bible says in Isaiah 51 verse 17. And it calls this cup the cup of trembling. Who can withstand this cup? To pick it up and to grasp it in our hands and to feel the weight of it and to move our nostrils above that liquid of God's wrath and to smell and take in the stench of it. So many times we take cough medicine and we give it to our, to our girls and they, they don't want to take one drink of that stuff. And sometimes because we're softies, I am <laughs> anyway. We'll let them not drink it. Oh, I'd rather just deal with the, I'd rather just deal with my runny nose, daddy. Do I really have to drink that cough syrup? And I'll, I'll cave in. No, that's okay. Sometimes we'll be at the, at the lunch table or the, the dinner table and they'll try a new food and I'll put it on their plate and <clears throat> Emily will put it on their plate and I just watch it all happen. And, uh, 
And they said, Daddy, this isn't, this isn't very good. And they've come to asking me this question. How many more bites? <laughs> How many more bites? And I'll tell them, just 27 more bites. But I'm telling you, those are little bites. You've never seen so, so little bites. I'm done, all 27 bites. Nothing else is gone. See, this cup, this cup is required. There's no moving it to the side. There's no getting rid of it. Every time we have sinned, the, the justice of God has poured more of God's wrath into this cup. And it's not just you, but it's all of humanity. And, and here we see in the Garden of Gethsemane, he says, Oh, my father, if it be possible, and I remind you that for the Lord Jesus Christ, it was possible, but for us, it is impossible. For the Bible says, it is appointed unto man once to die. There is no reprieve from that. There's no relief from that. It is required. The one day man will die. And the Bible says it is appointed unto man. It is an appointment not made by you and not made by me, but made by God himself with permanent ink that cannot be removed. And it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, the judgment, judgment and the punishment that results from it are not disconnected, but they are one in the same. And the Lord Jesus Christ says, if it be possible, and by the way, it was possible. He could have walked away. He did not have to do this. He did not have to redeem lost and fallen man. But he did not. He did not wonder if escaping his wrath was within the realm of possibility. He knew that he could walk away from death. But we can not. And that's why Isaiah 51 says that this is the cup of trembling because as we hold that cup in our own hand, we see an inevitable taste, an inevitable wrath, an inevitable judgment that is about to come upon us. And then I looked at something. Get Psalm 75 verse 8 on the screen at the very beginning of this verse on 75 verse number eight it says this concerning the location of this cup he says for in the hand of the lord there is a cup did the psalmist know all the implications of what is being said at the beginning of this verse that cup's not in your hand just yet. It's in the hand of the Lord, there is a cup. And in that garden of Gethsemane, the Lord in prayer to the Father looks down at his own hand and there is that cup. That cup of that cup of reckoning, that cup required, and that cup reserved for all of wickedness, all of wickedness. And he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he grabs the cup that's in his own hand. And he turns it all the way up and he drinks the full measure of it. Oh, he goes to the cross. He doesn't abandon all of mankind, although he would be justified in doing so. But instead, he lays down his life. And Judah shows up in that garden and he kisses the glorious cheek of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they ask, are you him? And he says, I am. And they all fall on their backsides. But he does not run, nor does he retreat. But he offers his hands that they might take him. And they do. One trial after another, falsely condemning him, for he was a righteous man and sinned not. There was nothing in the cup that belonged to him. He was righteous and holy and pure, and no wrath lay within it. Oh, but the cup that was now stirring in his belly that he had turned up was full of wrath. And the soldiers began to scourge. And to tear his flesh and his blood began to pour out upon the dusty earth below and mixing with that dust, making this bloody, muddy mess. And then they take him before the people. 
And Pilate says, I find no fault in him. And the crowd cries, crucify him. Crucify him. And he carries that cross through the streets of Jerusalem. And as the old author once said, I can tell you one thing about a man carrying a cross outside of a city. And that is he is not coming back. He lays his hands down on those wooden beams and Roman spikes, pierce the skin and flesh of the Son of God. And the cross is raised to its socket and dropped into place and in agony. The Savior drinks the cup. This goes on until something amazing happens, something startling, something shocking. But around, uh, around noon, the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 27, for from the sixth hour, which is noon, there was darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And in complete darkness, all you could do is hear the groans of the Savior as the sun was blotted out until finally at the ninth hour, you hear him cry, Eli, Eli. Lama Sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in the darkness of that moment, the father turned his back, not on his son, but on that cup and on our sin. And the wrath of God was poured out on the son of God for the only one that could drink that cup was a sinful transgressor. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, for he hath made him to to be sin for us who knew no sin. And as he took upon our sin, he drank every last drop of that cup. He emptied it. He emptied it. Oh, he emptied it and he cried, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And after that, he gave up the ghost. And that cup full of God's wrath now sat empty in the crucified body of Jesus Christ. What now with that cup? There is one other place in the Bible where we see an indication of this cup. And see this, this cup of, of reckoning and this cup reserved and this cup required. Once the Savior drank all of the contents, it was translated into a cup of, re, of redemption. <laughs> the psalmist says in Psalm 116, 13... The psalmist says, I, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And when Jesus Christ emptied that cup on Calvary, he handed an empty cup that was empty to the wrath of God. That was emptied of condemnation. That was emptied of the flames of the lake of fire. That was emptied of the wrath of God. And he says, here, I've drank the contents. Now you take this cup. And there the psalmist says, I will take the cup of salvation. And when the psalmist grabbed that cup, he found that there was no more wrath. There was no condemnation. But instead, it was filled with mercy and grace and the dust and reconciliation and redemption. There is a cup of redemption given to the world through Jesus Christ. Oh, and here I stand this morning redeemed. Redeemed not because I am good, not because I am great, but because Jesus took my cup and drank it. And I wonder... If those who are saved here, if we rejoice, how we ought to rejoice with this empty cup in our hands. That we'd serve as we ought to serve now that he has drank the full measure of God's wrath. And I wonder if there's someone here still this morning. 
when you look to the cup that's in your hand, it's still full of the wrath of God. Because you've never accepted the cup from the Son of God. There are two ways that sin can be paid for. Either you can pay for them yourself by taking that bitter cup without Christ and putting it to your lips and drinking of your own works and receive the condemnation of it. And you can pay for your own sin in a place called the lake of fire. Or you can take the free gift of salvation and receive the cup offered by Jesus Christ. Father, thank you. Father, thank you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness toward us, for you did not deserve that cup, but you drank it. Lord, I pray that you would stir your people. Lord, that we would praise you and rejoice in you for all that you have done to save us from our sins. And may we not be confused or think for one moment that we've done one thing to merit our own salvation. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here who's never drank the cup of your salvation, Lord, that they would do so today. With every head still bowed and every eye still closed, can I ask you, whose cup is in your hand? Many years ago, when I was a young boy, I reached toward the Savior and asked Him to save me. And He drank my cup and He gave me His. I know whose cup is in my hand. It's a cup given to me by Jesus Christ. But is the cup of God's wrath still in your hand? Has there ever been a time where you've received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? To think that we can be good enough to get to God is foolishness. Why would Christ have done all that if we could have just earned it ourselves? Whose cup is in your hand? And I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that would like to look towards heaven and just ask the Lord to pass the cup. If you're here this morning and you've never received Christ as your Savior, would you have the courage to raise your hand so that I could pray for you? Is there anyone like that? Say, Pastor Jared, the hand that I have raised is holding my own cup and I need the Lord's. Is there anyone like that today? If you've never received Christ, can I beg you? When we open this invitation, please come so we can take a Bible and show you how to be saved. Let's stand to our feet. Father, I pray you bless this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen.